This episode is brought to you in partnership with Wacom. Across the globe, learning is still handwriting-centric, especially in mathematics and science. This can make the shift to digital tasks challenging. Many schools are seeking effective apps and hardware to ensure a smoother transition for digital learning, especially for STEM lessons. Expanding digital pen and ink technology from teachers to students opens up new possibilities for communication and collaboration in and out of the classroom. Using pen-enabled devices, teachers and students can explain complex concepts, take notes, provide feedback, and show their work quickly and easily. Wacom pen displays and tablets easily plug in to the existing IT equipment in the classroom, enabling members of the class to interact with the digital content being shared. The teacher never even needs to turn their back on the class. Collaboration is simple when working on shared documents and apps with the digital pen. There's no new software to learn. You just work with the pen on the screen or tablet instead of the mouse and keyboard on your computer. As educators, myself, Steve and Ben have all integrated the use of Wacom technology into where we've worked in education, into colleges and schools, and we have seen the benefits for ourselves. So go check it out for yourself. Uh, The link is in the show notes for this episode. Let me tell you a, a little bit about myself, which is that uh, I don't have a formal background in education. Okay, I didn't study education as a as a subject. Uh, what I did study as a subject is physics, and later I worked on computer science. So I got into education, um, uh, you know, accidentally. And it's important to mention that um, because, uh, you know, why did I get into education in the first place and what did I do? Uh, When I I got myself into education, as I will describe in a a, a moment, I I had to do a bit of soul searching to say, why would people listen to me talking about education when they know that I do not have a background in education. So I fell back onto a a very time-tested method in science, which is that if I have something to say, can I send it to a peer-reviewed international journal? If they take it, then presumably what I've said is all right. So what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is to just step you through those key moments when peer reviewers accepted a result. And then I'll tell you what those results added up to. Okay, so um, let's see. Here we go. Uh, It all started with a guess back in, way back really, 1988. In 1988, in a conference in India, in Goa, I had said that if there are, you know, if there's a shortage of teachers to teach about computers, and if there are a shortage of computers to give to children and so on, why don't we just uh, give one computer, or two computers or something like that to the children and just leave them alone with it. And the ones who manage to use it will rise. Everybody hated that. They said, this, this is lousy. This is this is not research. I mean, what you're saying is that the best will get better and the rest will, you know, just sort of get left behind. Anyway, nothing happened. Nothing happened for 11 years. 11 years later, in 1999, I got an opportunity to try my idea. It was a very simple experiment. I just stuck a computer in a, into a wall in a slum near in, in New Delhi, where I was working, and I just left it there. So naturally, you know, if you, if you see a computer on the road, which is about three feet off the ground, Uh, stuck into a wall like a bank ATM or something. Uh, Children come in because it's so low, okay? The adults kind of say, well, why is is it down there? But anyway, so the children would come in 
and what would they do? And everybody said they'll do nothing because they haven't. Remember, this is 1999 because they don't know what a computer is. They don't know what the internet is. They don't know any English. So what do you expect? Well, that's not what happened. What happened was that the children made themselves computing literate, computer literate in English. They learned to use computers and the internet by themselves in less than six months. So I put all that together and I sent it off to a pretty good journal. You know, it's called the Australasian Journal of Educational Technology. And after struggling with the, with the referees who said, you know, your English is no good for social sciences. I mean, what do you think this is? This is not a physics journal. You're writing like a physicist, et cetera, et cetera. After several months, they said, but it's really interesting what you're saying. And they published it. That day, I knew that I had made a contribution that I can talk about instead of just saying, oh, you know, I did, did an experiment and uh, that's about it. So that was the beginning. What did it say? It just said groups of children, if left alone with the internet, can teach themselves to use it. The question that came up was, how do they teach themselves? Well, the World Bank came in and they funded a huge project for me. And I repeated the experiment many times. This time I used a proper social science method. And I was able to establish that this would always happen with children. I brought all those results with me to England in 2006. In 2006, the University of Newcastle uh, invited me to, to join them. And they said, you know, you work, uh, you know, it looks kind of interesting, so come over here. I came to Newcastle and uh, realized very quickly that you cannot do anything outdoors in northeastern England because it's usually raining and very cold. So uh, what I did instead was I, I took the hole in the wall inside the classroom. So what do you do? Well, you just take a computer, put it in the classroom, ask the children a question and say, can you figure that out? And exactly like it happened in India, but even better than the way it happened in India because the children in England knew English as their mother tongue. They started answering really difficult questions. And again, I faced that old query, who is teaching them? I said, well, just no one, doesn't seem to be anyone. What can they learn? Well, I did a whole set of experiments and was, let me put it this way. I wasn't able to find something that they couldn't learn. A group of children faced with the internet and a question never came back and said, we couldn't understand anything. Never. So, is that all it takes? A group of children, an internet connection, and a question. Well, teachers said, uh, we don't know. I mean, it, it, it sounds a bit, you know, far-fetched, but... In India, they asked me a, a, a really difficult question. They said, what if there is no one to ask the question? Where will you, where will you get the guy who asked the question? So I said, OK, let's turn to the internet again. And well, why can't I just beam a teacher in from somewhere? You know, back then, that was 2009, remember? It, it, it's not 2022, where I'm beaming myself at you. And you know this. I mean, you're very used to all of this, but not back then. So I started beaming teachers into classrooms where they would ask a question and the hole in the wall would take over and the children would learn by themselves. I sent it off to another journal. I think it was a Norwegian journal. The referees uh, said, OK, I mean, it's kind of well, I, I poorly written. <laughs> so, so I rewrote it and I rewrote it and I rewrote it and I got more data and I did all sorts of things. And it got published when it got published, and I keep saying this to you again and again, when it got published in a peer-reviewed journal, then I knew that what I had said makes sense to someone. At that stage, I got invited into a, a very famous place. You know, I got invited from Newcastle University to the Media Lab at uh, MIT 
Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge, Massachusetts in the US. And no less than Professor Nicholas Negroponte, the guy who had made the media lab, invited me there for a year. I went there for a year and I did a bit more work and I made a concept called a school in the cloud. And I said, you know, not like a website. It's just that why don't we bring the internet into schools, inside schools? Because remember, in most schools, even today, you're not allowed to bring in a device. And you're definitely not allowed to look at, you know, stuff on, on the internet while a, a lecture or a class is going on. I said, why don't we make something called a school in the cloud where everything is done on the internet? And I won the TED Prize <laughs> for saying that, okay? And uh, you, with that money, it was quite a bit of money, million dollars. With that, I brought that money into Newcastle University and they funded a research project by which we made um, uh, eight uh, labs, learning labs, schools in the cloud. Uh, five in India, or across the length and breadth of India, uh, two in uh, England, in northeastern England, inside schools. Uh, the picture you see here is of one of those in, uh, in, in uh, Newton Aycliffe County, Durham, and one in Harlem, New York. Everywhere you had the children, uh, eight, ten years old, twelve years old, and you would just ask them a question. There would be internet, they would huddle around the internet, the hole in the wall would happen. So where are we today, 2022? Well, here is what's happening. The hole in the wall. Millions and millions of children in India and Africa still going strong. You know, there's a there's an organization called uh, Hello World. Uh, they make these uh, kind of do-it-yourself kits called Hello Hubs, which are basically a kind of fold-up uh, hole in the wall. Uh, and they put it in Africa. In India, there's an organization called the NIIT Foundation. NIIT is where I was working when I did the experiment. NIIT Foundation puts these uh, into various places in India. Uh, I asked for an estimate from both of these organizations I got a stunning experience, a stunning number. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't think I could publish this, but they said over 10 million children. That's a lot of children. <laughs> okay. What about self organized learning environments? You know what those are? Those are the what I did in England. One computer inside the classroom, one or two or whatever, groups of children, and a big question. But that idea started traveling from Gateshead, where it started, throughout England, then throughout the UK, and to my surprise then, the rest of the world. China, Australia, South America, I went everywhere. And I saw everywhere groups of children doing what I had originally suggested, answering questions using the internet instead of listening to a lecture. It's still going on. There are thousands of teachers who have used this. Maybe there are a few of those, a few of them even listening right now. I made something called the granny cloud. Okay, this is the idea of beaming teachers in. And I thought, why don't we make a community of people who would kind of be amenable to being beamed in, you know, maybe once or twice a week or whatever it is. A cloud of volunteers. It worked wonderfully well for about 12 years, but eventually it closed. It closed just recently, a few weeks ago, actually. I learned a big lesson from there. A volunteer effort is not how you can make a globally sustainable scheme. You need an organization and you need a management team. You need marketing. I mean, you know this. I should have known this, but I didn't. Uh, the Granny Cloud, to me, today forms an incredible opportunity for those of you who would like to get into it from a different perspective. We have the 12 years of experience 
from the granny cloud that existed before. We have the people who actually beamed themselves in all over the world and spoke to children. If we can put all of that together, we could have a new granny cloud. And what happened to the school in the cloud? Well, I wish I could say they won worked wonderfully well everywhere. They didn't, OK? Remember I said I would built five of them in India, two of them in England, one in America. Of those eight, uh, one, two, three, four, four were inside schools. Sorry, five were inside schools, and three were out in the communities. Okay, they were glittering, beautiful-looking arrangements. All the ones inside communities stopped once the funding ran out. They said they did not understand how you can call something a school if it does not have a teacher. They said they did not understand how children are expected to learn things by themselves. This is not how, this is not how it works, they said. But inside the schools in England, in America, and one of them in India, they quickly understood what it's for. They started to use it. The teachers started to use it. The parents loved it. The children absolutely delighted by it. But there was a problem. Let me explain that problem to you. And that's the last bit, really. Exams. You know, in an exam, you're not allowed any assistance. You can't just, you know, look up a book or you can't. You definitely cannot bring in your smartphone into an exam. So the teacher said, what good is a school in the cloud where they learn how to answer questions using the internet if they are not going to be allowed to do that in real life? And I thought to myself, there's something wrong here because in real life, you and I, we look up the internet all the time. But looking up the internet during an exam is called cheating. So does it mean that you and I, when we look up uh, stuff on our phone, we're all cheating all the time? That sounded really bad, you know. <laughs> but, if it, but if it's not cheating, then why don't we allow the students to do it? Nobody listened for three years, I've been saying, allow children to use the internet during exams. Finally, this year, one country listened. The Ministry of Education, the government of Israel, started to experiment with putting in the internet into exam rooms. You can see a picture. This is an actual picture from Jerusalem of children answering a, an exam with, with the internet on. You know what we found? You might have thought, everybody's going to get an A plus in everything. Sorry, that doesn't happen. There's a difference of only 10%. That's about all. So we didn't allow the children to use the internet in exams because of an unproven, unmeasured assumption that it's cheating. We need to change that. If we don't change that, then all my method, the hole in the wall, the school in the cloud, is not going to take off. Another thing that needs to be done and you need to really understand this point, okay? We all use smartphones all the time, okay? We do everything with our smartphones. Look up maps, look up this, look up that. Whenever you have a question, you turn to your smartphone. Do you know how it works? I ask this to people. When you send a WhatsApp message from one phone to another, how does it get from one phone to the other? And people start guessing. Oh, it goes to a server. Let's say, which server? Where? More guessing, more guessing. We don't know. If you drive and I ask you, what's making the wheels on your car move? You would say the engine. If I say, what's uh, what's in the engine? You would say, well, the pistons, cylinders. You would know. In your GCSE, you learned about engines. But if I ask you how the internet works, you don't know. We use it 24 by 7, but we don't know how it works. That has to be changed. We need to make it a subject. 
you know, we, we shouldn't say we'll add it to computer science or we'll add it to science. No, it has to be a subject like history, geography, social science, a subject called the Internet. If we did make a subject called the Internet, who's going to teach it? Well, uh, teachers. Where would you get a teacher who can teach the Internet? If they could teach it well, they would be working for Google or Microsoft or somebody. You know, why would they work in a primary school? You're not going to get teachers. Oh, we, we can learn it from books. Oh, you're going to write a book on the Internet? How many days will it remain current? The Internet can only be learned from the Internet. We must understand that. And if, like any other subject, you have to examine people on the Internet about what they've learned on the Internet, they must be allowed to use the Internet. So you see my diabolical scheme. If we, if we allow the Internet, if we put in the Internet as a subject in schools, it cannot be taught and you can only examine it using the Internet. Last thing, you know, I used to think that people need to, children need to be able to read and write before they can use my method, the self-organized learning environment. I found out this year that that's no longer true. I, you know, <laughs> I, I'm old fashioned, I realized. Because computers can talk. The internet, actually, not, not computers. Computers are just the end point of the internet. The internet can talk and children can ask questions. In a school in uh, New Mexico in the United States, a teacher told me two-year-olds can do a self-organized learning environment. They just ask their computers or their devices. The devices talk back to them. And I said, my goodness, we've got to regulate this. I mean, what do those devices say? We don't know yet, but it's early days. The Internet can see, hear, speak, control things, and maybe it can think, no? <laughs> maybe it can think. Or does it only pretend to do these things? I don't know the answer, but I know we need to prepare a generation to face this question. Well, that's all I had, gentlemen and ladies. Thank you, Dan. Sagar, so, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, it, it, it's great to just, uh, I love that, uh, your diabolical scheme. Um, it's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's great. It really is. And it, it's, it's, I think for a lot of us as well, it's, it's, it's like, yeah, this should be happening. This should be what, well, why aren't we why aren't we venturing into into this territory already and and being innovative in education um we've got uh, we've, we've got i think we've got a few questions uh and some comments that we will put to you um let me just have a look here uh I think, yeah I know Darren, Darren's men, just a few comments that Darren's mentioned Merlin mind is a great example of self regulated learning I think that question from Dave Leonard is a great one that comes next time as well about the role of AI that he believes. Yeah, yeah that I knew one. there was yeah. a question there somewhere. Yeah, I was like, yeah, yeah. Where, where is it? There it is. My bit, and I'm done for the day. That's not my only bit. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, obviously, it's a, it's a most interesting and most important question right now. Except that uh, I must tell you that I am a little um, wary about uh, what we call AI, you know, artificial intelligence, that's, that's a really big word. Uh, let me give you an example. Suppose I wrote a program where if you, if you typed into the program, how are you, the program looks at a database of a hundred different responses and says, I am fine, I'm okay, I'm, how are you, et cetera, et cetera. Let's say a hundred, let's say 200, whatever. Then I put a random number generator so that when you say, how are you, you can't predict what it's going to say. 
I know that a lot of people who don't know much about computers are going to say, this is intelligent, you know, this is AI or whatever it is. Uh, is it? Well, as my last slide said, is it just pretending or is it really doing something intelligent? But you would say, for this stupid example, you would say, obviously, it's pretending. Well, let me counter that by saying, when I ask you, how are you? And you respond, involuntary response, like we all do when we say, how are you? And, and you say something. Do you Are you convinced that you're not pulling one sentence at random out of a database inside your head? <laughs> deep. That's deep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's why I said, is it pretending or is it real? Is a question that the next generation will need to face. I don't cool. have the answer. That's a great question. I think that idea around the ethics of AI comes up there as well, doesn't it? And about the rightness and wrongness. So, yeah. Yeah, I think as a former philosophy teacher, I know Ben is as well. We could, I think we could, to, to lend a phrase from Steve, we could talk about this all day, really. <laughs> uh, but if you, if you do want to listen to more, uh, we have got... Uh, this coming up for you later so at quarter past five we are launching our quarter past conscious. three it's quarter past three quarter past three <laughs> it's been a long day already lads one five is, is, is three dan <laughs> oh, i know geez. it's not one past three <laughs> I, 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 i've got dan here i've got him I'm, I'm holding it i've literally got the opportunity <laughs> normally it's me that trips I'm never up, gonna but... hear the end of this <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so uh, We've got, uh, I think it goes on for just slightly over an hour, uh, our in-depth interview with Sagata, which was recorded last week, and we'll be releasing on our podcast channel on YouTube at quarter past three, uh, but we'll also play it out live on this stream as well at the end of the day. So don't miss that. Sagata mentions a lot of the stuff he's mentioned just there, but we chat around it, we get it, we get in-depth in a lot of it. So Sagata, hold up that award for us again. Let's have a look at it. Yeah, there it is. That, Sagat uh, Amitra, uh, the winner of our Outstanding Achievement in Education Award 2022. Thank you very much, sir. It's been a it's been a delight to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you very much for this lovely award. Thank you again. <laughs>